So, it's 1981, and I'm five years old, pretty much just as I am today. Same face, smaller body, big hair. And it was the norm for me to come home after school and do whatever homework I had. See, I went to a school, and I have a family that believed in the power of homework. So reading a story, doing some basic addition and subtraction problems. I'm in my living room, sitting on the floor, in front of the coffee table, working. And I'm at home with my dad. Now, my dad, he's getting ready to retire from playing football. So he's this larger-than-life guy. He comes into the room, and he asks, what are you doing? And I have to explain to him, Daddy, I'm doing my homework. And as was his norm, he didn't say anything. He just took it in, and he left the room. I go back to what I'm doing, but I see him come back in the doorway. So I turn to see what he wants. I'm waiting, and with the seriousness of Charlton Heston, like when he played Moses, my dad looks down and points at me and says, remember, it's better to cheat than repeat. <laughs> now, I'm sure you think this man was joking, but this man was being dead serious. He meant every word of it. I'm this young, impressionable, fresh mind, and I'm thinking, what kind of advice is this? Who tells their own child? this, but it's a critical moment because it's the first piece of bad advice that my dad would ever give me that I can remember. And the list is long and distinguished. <laughs> One of my favorites was all fires are the same. And what he meant was that all fires could be treated the same, put out the same exact way. It's a favorite of mine because my dad could and did burned down every kitchen we ever owned. <laughs> and it's especially poignant because he actually did treat all fires the same. So at least he took his own advice. And in the gay, great kitchen fire of 93, <laughs> he would go on to douse a blazing grease fire with water, effectively creating a bomb that would utterly destroy the kitchen in that house. But by then, we'd grown accustomed to the bad advice the aftermaths, and my brother and I, we developed an amazing three-step response, and it goes like this. One, you start off with a pondering look that moves into a scowl. <laughs> Two, you say, dude, for real? <laughs> and then three, we would yell for my mom. <laughs> and my mom, an extremely intelligent and patient woman who loves my dad dearly, knows him better than anyone and always has, she knew, she knew who she married. And she long ago accepted that this was part of his character and resigned herself to swoop in to save us from just these types of situations. But I share these stories to say, I know bad advice. And I can tell you that bad advice is just as helpful, just as valuable as so-called good advice. You can use it the same exact way. You need to only consider the potential. Let me demonstrate for you a couple of theories. Theory one goes that bad advice can be used as guardrails, protecting you from the hazards of a particular situation. We all receive lots of advice throughout our lives on any particular item in our lives, a moment. The trick is to sort through those that will help you stay the right course. Identifying which ones will be effective, which ones won't, and which ones will push you towards extreme courses of action. It's in those extremes that's generally where bad advice lives. So if you can recognize these extremes, you can avoid it and save yourself. I'll give you an example. I'm learning how to drive, and I'm riding with my dad. <laughs> we're riding around in our neighborhood, and we're approaching an intersection. <clears throat> no one's around. As I approach the intersection, I'm slowing down, preparing to stop. My dad says, no copy, no stoppy. Keep going. <laughs> when my dad advises me to go through the intersection without stopping, I was able to do that while an option, it was an extreme option. See, when I would drive with my mother, she would make sure I came to a complete stop, looked in all directions before she would say, go ahead. My driver's ed teacher, a little less strict, at least come to the stop. 
And then, yeah, go on, go on. But my dad's little nugget, the only one that presented a danger. So I just didn't do it. Guardrails, loud and clear. Theory two, I like to refer to as the jujitsu effect. Basically, I can leverage what I've been given and flip it. So if you know that you've been given bad advice, or you know that the person who you've consulted with historically tells you the wrong thing to do, you can just simply avoid doing it, or you can use it to kind of figure out what the better situation, the better path might be. I got another example for you. So I'm a kid, I played soccer, and in one particular practice, there was a massive collision. I am knocked out, totally unconscious for a few seconds, and then I come to. My dad comes to pick me up. My coaches walk me over to the car. They want to explain to him what's going on, what happened, express their concern because I have this head injury, give their apologies. My dad takes it all in. He does the nod for me to get in the car, and I do. We're on our way home. He looks over, and he says, eh, you can sleep that off. <laughs> when he says, you can sleep that off, by now I knew that this man had a history of giving bad advice. So I just didn't do that. I deduced that it was essential for me to stay awake. And as soon as we got home, I went to the one source of logic that existed in our household, my mother, to confirm it. And obviously, she knew that children with concussions, you should probably stay awake. So what did I learn from my dad and all of his bad advice? First thing, I learned that I am part of an exceptionally funny and resilient family. I'm sure we all feel that way at some point in time, but I think about what has to be going on with us, that this is our normal interaction, and somehow we have managed to thrive. Two, my dad taught me that I was to question anything that does not sound, seem, or feel right. I was to speak up and have an opinion that not everything that I'm told could be trusted, accepted, or acted on. I learned how to pay attention. And number three, I learned that my dad trusted me. My dad trusted me to know the difference between right and wrong. He saw that five-year-old version of me he paid attention, and he believed that I would know the right thing to do. And the most important thing that I learned from my dad, the most important thing, I learned how to trust myself. I learned how to hear me. So yes, take in all that advice from your family, your friends, strangers. Yes, bad advice can give you the guardrails, and you can flip it. But you have to trust yourself. You have to be willing to take your own advice because more times than not, it's the best advice you are ever going to get. So it's 2013, a few months before my dad would unexpectedly pass away. And I've come home to spend the holiday weekend with my family. And around this time, I've started a master's program. So I'm sitting in my parents' living room on the floor in front of the coffee table studying. My dad comes in, and he says, what are you doing? And I have to explain to him, Dad, I'm studying. I've got this huge exam. I... Without missing a beat, my dad looks down at me, points, and says, remember, it's better to cheat than repeat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 